Okay, today we have a member of the Texas House of Representatives, James Tallarico. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. So obviously, uh, the big story out of Texas, and, and rightfully so, is that Democratic legislators in the State House walked out during a vote on the Republicans' voter suppression bill, it's a, uh, SB7, uh, and that deprived the House of a quorum and basically killed the bill. So first of all, you know, on behalf of everyone, thank you. Thank you for, for fighting. Thank you for getting it done. Well, it's it's an honor to do this work with my Democratic colleagues here in Texas. And as, as you know, this is a trend across the country uh, where Republicans are trying to undermine our democracy and rig the rules of the game in their favor. And um, and I'm proud that my colleagues and I decided to stand up to that that effort and um, and successfully kill SB7. So walk us through the events leading up to the walkout. How did the idea come about? You know, I, this has been a, a really terrible session uh, here in Texas. Um, the Republican Party uh, after 2020 is emboldened in our state and has decided to push through some of the most radical far right legislation that we've seen in this state, um, a heartbeat bill that effectively bans abortion in Texas. Um, we've seen uh, bills to discriminate against transgender kids uh, in our state. We've seen legislation to pass permitless carry, which means that anybody can can carry uh, weapons of war on our streets uh, without a permit. And so this this voter suppression bill was really the the straw that broke the camel's back. And and breaking quorum is is not a not a decision that we take lightly. Um, it, it's only reserved for the most egregious abuses of power and and undermining our democracy uh, certainly meets that threshold. Uh, and so the the decision was kind of made throughout the weekend as the as details of the final the final bill uh, came to light, and we saw how terrible it was going to be for so many of of our democratic constituencies. Now, did Republicans expect you to do this? You know, I I, I think that Republicans knew we were um, we were fed up with their with their antics this session. I think they knew how how much of an affront uh, SB seven was to to not just Democrats but really anyone who cares about democracy in the state of Texas. Um, so I, I think they knew we were going to take some dramatic steps to fight the bill. I don't think they knew we were going to go all the way of, of walking out of the chamber, breaking quorum, uh, and, and killing the bill in the final hours of the session. We're going to see SB7 again. Um, Governor Abbott had promised to bring this bill up again in a, in a special legislative session this summer. So how do you intend on blocking this legislation the next time? Well, you know, thanks to people like you, we are, uh, we are getting a national spotlight on Texas. Uh, everyone in the country is talking about SB7 and the Republicans' attempts to, to really destroy representative democracy as we know it. And, and that kind of spotlight, that kind of attention, I think will force Republicans back to the negotiating table. And hopefully, you know, I, I do think we're going to pass some type of voter suppression bill. But as Texas Democrats, our goal is to limit the damage that this bill will do to, to our democratic system, um, but, but in particular, the damage it can do to vulnerable communities across our state, in particular, our black and brown communities. So um, I'm hopeful that, that this renewed attention, this, this controversy that has, that has kind of spread across the, the nation, across the world, will allow us to negotiate a much better version of this bill in the special session. Just to just to build on that a little bit, you, you you were speaking about shining a spotlight on it. Republicans are now saying that that the no voting until 1 p.m. on Sunday was was a typo, a typo. Yeah. Like who among us, right? Who among us hasn't accidentally <laughs> targeted the entire black church community by by accidentally uh, uh, blocking them from voting after church? Like my finger slipped and I accidentally suppressed an entire community. That's exactly <laughs> right. Well, so two things. One that that does point to the, the process problem. This, this bill um, was, was changed dramatically in the final hours of the session, and it was changed behind closed doors in the dead of night, and no one got to see kind of what it, what it looked like in its totality until the very end of the session before we were going to vote on it. So, you know, a typo is certainly possible, but the reason I'm, I'm skeptical of that excuse is that uh, the senators uh, in the other chamber who put that provision in the bill defended it on the House right. floor, also, uh, not only was it, you, could, you know, they say it was just changing 11 to 1, but you also had to change a.m. to p.m. So right. it, it makes you skeptical that this was actually a typo. Um, what right. I think 
is occurring is this, this new spotlight on Texas Republicans is forcing them to backtrack. And I hope that continues in the weeks and months ahead, as long as the rest of the country has our back. You had mentioned just prior um, that you do expect some type of, of you know, voter I- integrity bill to pass. Is another walkout possible? Are there ways for Republicans to prevent something like that from happening? No, you know, this, I, I should say in Texas history, uh, breaking quorum has only happened four times. And when I was in high school, uh, I, I remember a group of Texas Democrats uh, not only breaking quorum and walking out of the chamber, but actually fleeing the state of Texas so that the, the Texas Department of Public Safety couldn't bring them back to the House chamber. Uh, and, and that lasted for, for more than a month. Uh, and so, you know, I think Texas Republicans have a long memory and they, they know that, that a, a, a full quorum break like that is, is still certainly possible. So I'm hoping that, that that possibility combined with the renewed attention on this issue can, can help keep our Republican colleagues in line and help them pursue a more moderate path in this, in this attempt to, uh, to please President Trump and his big lie. If you guys end up fleeing Texas and you need somewhere to go, California is always, uh, always, always happy to take you. Perfect. Anything to avoid yeah. go, going to Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so assuage my fears here because it's often hard to imagine a scenario where they just drop their efforts altogether, right? So on the major, most dangerous provisions of this bill, is failure an option here? You know, I think, I think it's, it's your right to be realistic. You know, we live in a Republican dominated state. They control the executive branch, the judicial branch and the legislative branch. And their far right Republican primary voters who they rely on to get reelected are demanding that their Republican officials indulge Donald Trump's big lie. And they demand these types of voter suppression uh, methods. You know, I, I personally am friends with a lot of my Republican colleagues in the House. Many of them you know, don't believe in the big lie. Many of them um, don't want to pass voter suppression. Uh, unfortunately, they lack the, the moral courage to, to speak about that publicly. But I'm hoping that we can take advantage uh, of their hesitancy and we can at least push them toward more symbolic uh, provisions in the bill uh, and, and, and avoid some of these uh, provisions that really do harm the ability of our communities, in particular our black and brown communities, from accessing the franchise. Um, you know, if we can if we can start to remove some of these criminalization efforts in the bill that, that criminalize really simple mistakes in voter registration or in voting itself, that would be a big win. If we can protect souls to the polls uh, for our black churches in Texas on Sundays, that would be a big win. Um, you know, if we can limit the, the powers of these vigilante poll watchers, uh, that would be a big win. So. We need to be pragmatic and we need to be realistic in what we're trying to accomplish here. Killing SB7 is temporary. I don't think we have we stand any chance of killing the bill in its entirety, but we can certainly limit the damage and protect our voters across the state. But I, I want to keep our, our attention on national Democrats because Texas Democrats did our part and will continue to do our part. We stayed united. We stood up to the bullies in our own chamber. Uh, and we've delayed this bill to give national Democrats in the House, the Senate, and the White House time to pass the For the People Act uh, to, to blunt any impact of SB7. So I hope that Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema and Joe Biden will, will take a, a page out of the Texas Democrats playbook. Yeah, I mean, especially, you know, you're in the minority and still managed to just figure it out, do what was necessary to stop these anti-democratic efforts. Right. National Democrats are in the majority and still aren't managing to, you know, to get their shit together right now. That's right. No, that's exactly right. And, and you know, I think we were motivated by a deep um, sense of, of history. You know, we, we mourned the loss of John Lewis not too long ago. And, and to remember what he and other leaders in the civil rights movement went through to to protect this this sacred right to vote you know that that motivated us to to really rise to the occasion um, and do our part to to honor his legacy and and it's shocking to me that national democrats can't summon the same courage uh, or the same uh, commitment to their convictions uh, but I hope that changes uh, after what we've done here in Texas. Hopefully Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are listening right now. I'm sure they're avid listeners. <laughs> a lot of people do listen, uh, and I hope it gets <laughs> so. I, I, I have a feeling that they are 
they're starting to feel the pressure along with President yeah. Biden, um, who I support, but, um, but he has got to know that this is a, a national emergency. Our, our democracy is facing a grave risk um, and, and we're, you know, we are on the path of losing it entirely. Um, so I hope that our actions here in Texas can, can shake their conscience uh, and push them to act. So Abbott had also threatened to withhold pay for the legislature. Clear this up for me. The legislature is majority Republicans. So wouldn't a move like that hurt mostly Republicans? And beyond that, assuming the legislators just want to get paid, couldn't they just override his, his veto? Well, you know, Texas legislators, unfortunately, don't get paid very much. I get paid a salary of $400 a month after taxes. But yeah. our legislative staff, who really do all the work in this building, they're the ones, they're the unsung heroes who... Who, who make this process possible, they do have, have salaries that they rely on to support their families. And so Governor Abbott is, is playing politics with their livelihoods. And it's, and it's both foolish and, uh, and embarrassing, but also really frightening. You know, these, these types of autocratic tactics that we saw from President Trump are being mimicked by Republicans across the country, like Greg Abbott, like uh, Ron DeSantis. Um, and, and although it may seem funny to the rest of us, it, it really does um, represent a, a frightening reminder of the threat that uh, Trump Republicans pose to our democracy. So you're 32, correct? As of the, two weeks ago, yes. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy, <laughs> happy belated birthday. You're the, you're, if I'm not mistaken, you're the youngest legislator in the House? That's correct. So your district had been long held by a Republican. Your predecessor was, was a Republican. What was your message for your constituents in getting elected? And, and what does that say about Texas politics more broadly? Yeah, you know, I, I, I represent a district that uh, within its current boundaries hadn't uh, elected a Democrat since before I was in kindergarten. Um, in fact, a, a Democrat didn't even run in this district in 2016. Um, and so I threw my hat into the ring in 2018 as a first time candidate. I was 28 years old, former teacher, had never run for office before. Um, but, you know, I, not only did I, I flip a Republican district, I'm also ranked as one of the most progressive members of the Texas House. And most of the time, folks think those two things are mutually exclusive, right? If you're going to appeal to appeal to moderate voters, you have to somehow have moderate principles or propose moderate legislation. And in my experience, um, that's not true. You know, Texans in particular like backbone. Uh, they like someone who's going to stand up for their own beliefs, their own convictions, and and not back down. Um, and and in my experience, you know, voters, Republicans, independents, and Democrats, they want someone who's going to be honest with them. They're going to want someone who's going to stand up to bullies, and they're going to want someone who's going to push for bold legislation that actually makes an impact on their daily lives. And so I hope that's a a lesson Democrats across Texas and across the country can learn from. Um, you don't have to water down your beliefs to to win over voters. Yeah. I mean, more and more we're seeing, you know, these these unapologetic progressives winning in places where you would think that progressives wouldn't stand a chance at winning from from you and your very district right there in Texas to, you know, the Katie Porters of the world who who flipped, uh, I believe it's California's 45th, which had never voted for a Democrat in its existence. So, you know, more and more we're seeing that we should be running Democrats anywhere and running, uh, you know, uh, on platforms that are that bring out our agenda because our agenda at the end of the day, you know, every, Democrats have this reputation of being afraid of our own shadows, but our agenda is popular, you know? And, and, and Republicans don't have an agenda anymore. I mean, it's, it's astonishing to me uh, in the wake of the Trump presidency that Republicans have really abandoned any sense of fiscal conservatism. They've stopped fighting for lower taxes and less spending. You know, all they have at this point is culture wars and, yeah. and this kind of, you know, um, battle against wokeness. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really a, the Republican Party is a shell of its former self, ideologically speaking. And so they have they've left the field to us. Um, our ideas have, I, I think, have won the day. And there is now a, a general consensus in the country that government can be a force for good and can improve people's lives. And that's a that's a huge victory that we need to capitalize on. Well, we'll see if running on canceling Dr. Seuss is not going to do it for him. So right. uh, with that said, that's right. <laughs> So with that said, again, thank you to you and the Democratic delegation there in Texas. You know, I, I hope you realize how refreshing it was to see a Democratic delegation not only not shy away from the fight, but actually actually win it, you know, for now. So just keep pushing and you got a lot of people behind you. You know, wow. you've, you've helped energize a Democratic Party that needed it. 
I just want to thank you. Um, I know you're not from Texas. Uh, you don't live here, but the fact that you're using your platform um, to, to shine a light on, on our battle here means a lot to all of us. Uh, so we'll, we'll consider you an honorary Texan. <laughs> thanks. I'll take it. <laughs> all right. Well, Representative Tallarico, thanks for, for taking the time to speak. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you.